Ever since I reviewed the WA7, I've been maining it as my main tube amplifier alongside my solid state amplifiers over there. Now, as much as I love this thing in my main review, I've actually come to enjoy it even more. But like everything, it's not perfect. It does have some room for improvement. Now, tube rolling this has actually been a goal of mine for a while now. Now, today we're going to find out a couple of things. One, we're going to find out if we can actually do a sonic upgrade with the ray tubes from Opus actually. So I'm curious what the benefits of the ray tubes are actually going to be. So I'm gonna give this a thorough listen, make some notes for myself, and uh, I wanna do a little bit of research on the stock tubes that this comes with. Now this actually begs the question, what exactly am I looking to improve on this if I love it so much? Well, it's very, very good for full-size headphones, not as good for IEMs. It has a little bit of a noise floor for really sensitive IEMs. I like to see if tubes are responsible for that or if something else in the amplifier is responsible for that, that tubes won't change. Either way, I'd like to isolate the issue and see if I can resolve it through a tube roll. The other thing that this doesn't do is give a massive sound staging advantage to a solid state amplifier. Now, again, when you're talking about that benefits versus drawbacks things, this is one of those things where it already sound stages pretty well. Is an extra 10% width in sound staging worth uh, a difference in top end fidelity or mid range tonality? A lot of times you have to trade those things off and like I said, it may or may not be worth it. So if you're pulling tubes out and you're curious what some of the naming schemes mean. On this, it actually has two, but they mean exactly the same thing. So this is a 12AU7 tube, but it's also an ECC82 tube. Basically, these are completely interchangeable. One is the European standard and one is the American standard, but basically they're the same thing. Interestingly, you might not always see 12AU7. Sometimes you will see 12AX7 or AT7. And there are some notable changes in this, mostly in terms of gain. The gain difference between an X7 and a U7 is quite different. Technically, these sockets are interchangeable but it's really not recommended. These amplifiers are built from the ground up to work with a certain type of tube, if the engineer knows what they're doing at least. Don't try to get smart and risk hurting your gear. It's oftentimes gonna work the best with the socket that it was made for. Just try to get a tube that matches your preferences and the specifications that it was built for. Now, I actually didn't know this before doing research on this right now. Uh, a breakdown of the 12 AU7 part. Um, the 12 is for the filament voltage, the AU is just the product designation. So you have AX, AT, for example, AU. Uh, and then seven is the amount of filaments in there. Now, quite frankly, Wu knows what they're doing when it comes to pairing a tube with an amplifier. It's kind of what they do. Uh, and so a lot of times I kind of trust their judgment on which tubes they like with what amplifiers. And I find a lot of times the stock tubes have more benefits than detriments than switching to a different tube, which may have different tonal properties, different benefits and drawbacks, but usually comes with less benefits and more drawbacks than the tubes that come with the device. But what I do wanna state here in my personal experience is that tube price doesn't really dictate how it sounds. Uh, since tubes are a purely subjective experience, I have heard cheap tubes that I love and expensive tubes that I hate and vice versa. I've heard expensive tubes that are great and cheap tubes that are terrible. <laughs> I won't pretend to have some high level understanding of how the inner workings of like an actual vacuum tube works, but I did want to do personally like a little bit of a refresher and read into it a little bit because it's always really been interesting. This is from circuitdigest.com, so I'm not going to take credit for like claiming to know this or anything. So this is just me reading their information to you. But in most vacuum tubes, the cylindrical cathode is heated by a filament, not too different from that of a light bulb, causing the cathode to emit negative electrons that are attracted by a positive charged anode, causing the electric current to flow into the anode and out of the cathode. On a different website, MacintoshLabs.com, kind of explains how it translates a little bit better. In order to function, cathodes and anodes interact in a vacuum in order to create enough voltage to power a speaker. The voltage enables the electricity to turn into an audible sound, basically. My very rudimentary understanding is that basically you have this cylindrical cathode, which is heated by the filament. The filament emits negative electrons, which interact with the positively charged anode. That generates electricity. That electricity then moves a speaker or a driver of some kind. What's wild to me is that this sounds even more advanced than how a solid state amplifier works. And instead of that, they use transistors like a, a typical computer would, for example. So yeah, I just kind of found this a little interesting and I wanted to share. Okay, now the Oppos Ray tubes, they are 108 $180. Why? So these have two major things going for them that would kind of dictate this price a little bit. The two things are gold pins, which the stock tubes on the WA7 
do not have. Um, and these are also something called a matched pair, which is actually a legitimate thing. It's not just marketing. It is sort of a science to make these, but it's not an exact science where every tube is actually manufactured and has the same results. So some things that can differ are gain, conductance, noise, and microphonics. And Opus will go through all of that to uh, make sure that they have uh, similar performance and that's what the matched pair is for. And I'm not just shilling for Oppos here either. These are a little bit on the more expensive side, uh, but actually if you want to look for a matched pair of tubes with gold pins, this is actually around about the price that you can expect. Anywhere between about $140 to $200 is actually very common for a matched pair of gold pin 12AU7s. Now some tube amplifier companies are going to use matched tubes to begin with. They'll usually market that so you usually know. And let's just say for the sake of example that these WA sevens are not using matching tubes that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have audible performance differences between the two tubes you're unlikely to hear a difference between the two sides unless the differences are actually pretty major but if you want to pay for the guaranteed performance between the two that's what you're going to have to pay so after searching around for the internet for a while i can't actually find uh this exact tube which is a bit unfortunate i would have liked to have bought more the part that i'm having problems with is the double set of numbers down at the bottom. If I'm being honest, I don't actually know what these mean. They could mean nothing. They could just be a serial number of sorts. They could be a uh, batch number. Um, it could be a bunch of different things. I, I really don't know. But it doesn't look like I'll be able to pick up a separate pair of these exact uh, tubes, at least not without buying another uh, WA7. Now, if there are more traditional prices or any indication, and I will, I'll drop a link to Amazon um, for the 0808s, um, which is the number I was talking about here. These are approximately $33 a piece. So total set running about 70 bucks. So the rate tubes, uh, these are in one word coherent. They are very clear compared to the stock tubes. The stock tubes in comparison have kind of a more generic warm characteristic. They're a little bit more focused in the lower mid range, a little bit rolled off in the top end, a little bit rolled off in the treble response compared to the ray tubes. The ray tubes are in general more clear. They have a more well-defined and solid sub bass response, for example. The mid bass and the lower mid range are approximately the same, both a little bit warmer leaning than something like a solid state would be. The real differences lie in the upper mid range and the treble response. The fidelity of the upper mid range out of those ray tubes is actually quite significantly better than that of the stock tubes. The ray tubes do have a more forward treble delivery, but it's matched with an equal amount of fidelity. So it feels very clear. And I think that's a lot of where the coherence factor is coming into play. Now, what it's actually not doing a ton of is adding a lot of tube warmness to the sound over the default tubes, though it is warmer than something like a solid state. Even myself internally, I'm conflicted about this. One of the reasons why I listen to tubes is that tube warmness. But I do have to say that the added clarity here matched with a little bit of warmness is pretty nice. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly and generically, and maybe not all that uh, technical on the, the description of, but it sounds higher fidelity in general than that of the stock tubes. But I think it's completely fair to bring up that that may not be the reason why you are listening to the tubes. Personally, that is not necessarily the reason why I am listening to tubes. I listen to solid states for fidelity and tubes for tonality a lot of times. Now tubes are gonna play differently on every single amplifier you put them on. And one of the things about this particular amp is I feel like this is a good compromise between a good tonal shift into a uh, kind of more tubey sound, but also having some really nice definition and detail characteristics of a more kind of active treble response. Those two factors combining here makes for a very complete sounding tube without going too sterile for tonality and without going overly detailed into technicality. The atmospheric potential was actually an improvement on the ray tubes. It does actually widen this. Now I did confirm that the reason this amplifier never felt very wide is because of the tubes. Stock tubes, not very wide sounding. The rays, I think partially because of that trouble response, partially because everything seems a little bit more coherent and clear. The sound staging width and potential is just a lot better on the ray tubes, but you might also want a more focused delivery of the stock tubes, depending on what you're into. One thing I did notice was not a factor of the tubes was the noise floor on IEMs. This amplifier is just not good for IEMs, unfortunately. Unless you have really inefficient IEMs, like some of the planar IEMs might do well on this. But if you have really efficient IEMs, like my Fur M5s, the noise floor on here is just 
basically too much to be a, a really pleasing experience. And both the tubes had basically the same performance for noise force. So that was not an improvement. So are these an upgrade? Well, it depends on how you're looking at it. If you're looking at sound fidelity over subjectivity, yes. If you're looking at subjectivity, it really depends on what you like subjectively. One of the things I like about the stock WA7 tubes is that they are warmer, but they're not super dark sounding. They don't completely quell the highs. They don't completely kill things like uh, the upper mid range. They actually sound really complete. Um, one of the things I like about the Rays though, is that they do add an extra layer of clarity and enhancement to a lot of things. But sometimes the benefits of tubes is not adding stuff, it's taking stuff away. So it really depends on which specific thing you were looking for. So like anything subjective, it depends on subjectively what you like. So I can't give you that answer.